Good afternoon to Indian country and our federal partners at the White House. Thank you for joining us today on this special session on combating COVID-19 in Indian country. My name is Victoria Kitchian. I'm an enrolled member of the Winnebago tribe in Nebraska and serve as the chairwoman of my tribe. On my dad's side, I come from the San Carlos Apache tribe and I represent the next generation of tribal leadership. This morning I woke up and um, I spoke the words of the great late Frank Lemire Wanigida. And he said, make them uncomfortable. And so we're here today to have nation to nation dialogue with some distinguished tribal leaders and our distinguished federal partners. And we started this day with a prayer and we do that in our protocol. And we, we do that because that's what our, our ancestors did. And those prayers brought us to this point and those prayers are gonna take us forward. And there's three things that I thought of. I thought the creator puts us where he needs us. And when we have hard times, Indian people come together. Much like today, we've come together with a tribal nation summit and we're gonna have dialogue and, and questions and answers. And we're gonna to come to a point of understanding and that understanding is gonna carry us forward. And the last thing that I thought of today was, and we heard it from the youth, we heard it from Madam Secretary, the ancestors are with us. And so I'm just here to, to celebrate that on this distinguished panel. And we're here to talk about something difficult, a hardship on Indian country, and that's battling COVID-19. So at this time, it's my honor to be joined by Secretary Becerra from the Department of Health and Human Services and Dr. Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at the National Institute of Health and Chief Medical Advisor to the President. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. I'd like to invite Secretary Becerra to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Kichian, uh, for moderating this session. And thank you to the tribal leaders in attendance and the White House Council on Native American Affairs for making today possible. I want to recognize uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, and thank you, Dr. Fauci, for reminding me I could take off the uh, mask, for his tremendous, tremendous leadership uh, throughout this pandemic. We need to, today to celebrate all we've accomplished together and recommit ourselves to the work that still lies ahead. For more than a year, the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic to tribal nations has underscored the health inequities faced by American Indians and Alaska Natives. But because of the strong leadership and unwavering compassion, tribes have served as a model to follow as we tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. And that compassion guides us at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, our 80,000 strong workforce, of which, by the way, nearly 11,000 or some 13 and percent are of indigenous descent. Our first priority is to beat this pandemic and get our communities vaccinated. As of this week, IHS has administered over 1.78 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine in Indian country through tribal and urban Indian health programs. 870,000 or so of these vaccines have been administered by tribes alone. And because of tribal leadership, I'm happy to say that the American Indians have the highest COVID-19 vaccination rate in the US today. And now that we have a COVID-19 vaccine for kids ages five to 11, that means that 28 million children are eligible to, be, to get vaccinated and we will need tribes to step up to the plate once again. The Indian Health Services jurisdiction has distributed 74 and a half thousand pediatric vaccine doses already to 146 IHS tribal and urban Indian organization facilities. And as of November 10th, the ITU facilities have administered first doses to over 3,500 children ages five to 11 years of age. Some ITU facilities started administrating pediatric vaccines as early as November the 3rd. And many facilities are planning large scale events in the coming weeks, expanding hours for after school vaccinations and are integrating COVID-19 vaccinations into routine pediatric care. The vaccines 
for our children are safe and effective. So let's work together to get our kids vaccinated and keep them safe. In addition, HHS has distributed more than $9 billion in COVID-19 supplemental funding to Indian country through IHS. $6 billion, which was provided through the American Rescue Plan. Many of you have been working with us in that regard. These resources have supported critical response activities such as drive-through test sites, community vaccine distribution efforts, and the provision of high quality health care in Indian country. But of course, none of this transformational work can be done without all of you. That's why throughout this pandemic, HHS has engaged in meaningful ongoing consultation with tribal leaders. For instance, in August, we held the first ever tribal consultation sessions to consider a potential mandatory funding proposal for Indian health services. And just over two weeks ago, in collaboration with other federal departments, HHS participated in the nation to nation dialogue with Indian country on the COVID-19 response. This dialogue was in response to your request for a national debrief of the whole of government response to COVID-19. And your feedback is not only informing our ongoing response, but will also help us better prepare for potential future national emergencies. Because of these engagements and collaboration, HHS was able to enter into a memorandum of agreement on native languages. Through this memorandum of, of agreement, we have committed to working with our federal partners and tribes towards the preservation, protection, and promotion of native rights and freedoms to use, practice, and develop native languages. Every one of those young people that we saw in that video with the first lady when she did her presentation should feel very proud of this particular development. As secretary, I'm proud to help lead a the critical tribal work being done across HHS's agencies, not just at IHS. I will continue to advocate for tribes and ensure that HHS keeps up its work with other federal departments and agencies to strengthen the federal COVID-19 response in Indian country. Now I want to hear from you about how we can strengthen our partnership, not only in addressing COVID-19, but in preparing for future challenges as well. We're here to listen to you, learn from you, work together with you to build back better. And we thank you for letting us participate. Thank you, Secretary Becerra. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Fauci for the latest updates on where we are with combating COVID-19. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Kachion. It's a real great pleasure to be here with Secretary Becerra to talk to the White House Tribal Nations Summit. And as the chairwoman mentioned, I'm going to just take a few minutes to go over with you some of the important and salient features of what we are all experiencing right now. As you can see from this slide, the United States has been very severely hit by this historic pandemic with almost 49, 47 million cases and close to 760 deaths thus far, making this the worst outbreak of a respiratory illness that we've experienced in well over 100 years. This is a slide showing the various surges that we've experienced since the winter of 2020, 2019, 2020. I want you to focus on the right-hand part of the slide where you see where we have peaked from the summer surge and are coming down. However, over the last few weeks, we're seeing a plateauing of cases at around 70,000 per day, an unacceptably high level, and I will get back to that in a moment when we talk about boosters. For those who get symptoms, and about 30 to 40% of people get no symptoms, but for those who do, about 80% are mild to moderate, and about 15 to 20% are severe to critical, leading to a variable case fatality rate of anywhere from two or so percent up to close to 20% in people who require ventilatory assistance. Among the individuals who do get severe illness, they are very heavily weighted towards the adults, mostly elderly individuals, and people at any age with certain underlying medical conditions. And here is where the applicability to the tribal nations come in. 
Because those who get severe disease and have a strong propensity to that, it is almost always related to the underlying medical conditions that they have. They're listed on their slide, but prominent among these is obesity, diabetes, hypertension, chronic lung, and cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, these are conditions that are much more prevalent among the tribal nations as opposed to the general population, which is one of the more important reasons why we must protect these people. Now, for those who get manifestations of severe disease, it's a wide spectrum dominated by the acute respiratory distress syndrome, but also there are neurological, cardiovascular, and kidney involvement, as well as a hyperinflammatory and hypercoagulable state leading to multiple organ system dysfunctions. Now, take a look at this slide because this is directly applicable to why we are here today. If you look at the cumulative rates of COVID-associated hospitalizations by race and ethnicity in the United States, look at that top red bar. American Indians and Alaskan Natives clearly dominate that picture, even more so per 100,000 population than African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians, and certainly Caucasian populations. Again, a double jeopardy of vulnerability. Also, there's what we call post-COVID conditions. Not only residual organ system dysfunction, for example, because of damage to the lung, but also signs and symptoms not completely explainable by readily apparent pathogenic processes. We refer to that as long COVID. One of the problems with long COVID is that someone who even gets mild to moderate COVID syndrome can still have a persistence of symptomatology that lasts weeks and sometimes months after the resolution of acute disease. Let's turn for a moment now to what we're doing about it. Selective therapeutics, one is to target the virus, the other is to moderate the host response. For example, when someone has an aberrant inflammatory response and we treat them with common steroids like dexamethasone. But to target the virus, we have one FDA-approved IV drug called remdesivir. Other antivirals, particularly oral ones, that are now being tested, and a whole group of monoclonal antibodies. The take-home lesson for this slide is that if you're not successful in preventing infection and you do get infected, there are therapeutic interventions that can prevent you from going to the hospital. In fact, the treatment guidelines, which the NIH has put online, merely by going to the NIH website, as well as if you need monoclonal antibodies, there's a combat COVID antibody call center, which you can get merely by calling this number or going online to see the availability of monoclonal antibodies. However, looking forward, the therapy that's associated with specific antiviral drugs that target the vulnerable targets of the SARS-CoV-2 replication cycle. A major effort at the NIH is now directed at trying to develop and discover antivirals that are directed against these targets. Now, I know this is a complicated slide, but really we can simplify it. The big circle is a cell in your body such as a cell in your nasopharynx. The little circles are the virus. When the virus infects a cell, it reproduces itself, but it must go through multiple steps. And each of the steps is a vulnerable target for an antiviral drug. And the yellow highlighted boxes are some of the drugs that are being developed. You may have heard of some of them. One of them is malnupiravir, which developed in uh, association and collaboration with early research from the NIH. It is developed by Merck and Ridgeback. Very importantly, in a placebo-controlled trial, 
looking at people who are treated with this oral medication early in the course, namely the first three to five days of infection, diminished by 50% the likelihood that they would be hospitalized or died compared to placebo. And again, with eight deaths in the placebo and zero deaths in the treatment. Another drug that is now, again, before the FDA to determine the likelihood of getting an emergency use authorization. It is a protease inhibitor from Pfizer. Remember, Pfizer is one of the companies that makes the mRNA vaccine. And in a similar trial, it was shown to decrease by 89% the likelihood of a person getting to the hospital or dying if they took this drug orally for five days, starting within three days of symptomatology. And so there are solutions in addition to preventing. Now let's get to vaccine and we'll close with that. The vaccine work over the last year and a half has been deemed by Science Magazine as the science breakthrough of the year for good reason, because in record time, we were able to go from a recognition of a brand new virus to getting highly effective vaccines into the arms of individuals within 11 months. And these are the list of the three vaccine platforms, the six companies, and their status. As you know, we now have one vaccine, the Pfizer-BioNTech, getting full approval, and two of them, Moderna and J&J, &J, getting an EUA, namely three vaccines in the United States available for usage. What is the status of vaccines for children? You heard the secretary talk about the importance of vaccinating children. We now have EUAs or emergency use authorization for Pfizer from adolescents 12 to 17. Again, we have an EUA for children five to 11, very recently given. And now we have other approaches towards getting enough data to see if we can even vaccinate younger individuals. And we will keep you posted on that. But let's look at the results. The results are really impressive. If you compare a vaccinated person with an unvaccinated person, in the era of Delta, you diminish by fivefold at least the likelihood of being infected, and now recent data by 10 to 15-fold the diminution in the risk of hospitalization and deaths. These vaccines are safe. 7.3 billion doses have been administered globally and over 435 million doses in the United States. The long-term side effects are not seen and the safety profile is good. So just to underscore what the secretary mentioned, we're dealing with safe and highly effective vaccines. However, there's a challenge now, and the challenge is the Delta variant that has a much greater transmissibility than the alpha variant that we were dealing with several months ago, because the level of virus in the nasopharynx is a thousand times greater. What does that mean for us? Well, we know from the Israeli study that the immunity, although it is really good, particularly against severe disease and hospitalization, over time it wanes. And the Israelis are seeing it's waning in all age groups. This brings up the issue of a booster shot. Boosters are shots of the original or even a mixed and matched vaccine that you received that we know greatly enhances the protection. This is a study from Israel that showed that in people who had waning immunity, if they were given at least five months after their original vaccination, a third booster shot with an mRNA, they diminished by about 11 plus fold the likelihood of infection and almost 20 fold the likelihood of severe illness. 
This is very clearly graphed on this slide. The red bar is the rate of confirmed infection for 100,000 in those who were not boosted. The blue bar is the rate of infection for 100,000 in those who were boosted. When you look at the unvaccinated in red, that's the infection per 100,000 of severe disease in individuals 60 or over. The blue is if you've gotten two doses, but look how low the boost gets you. The message I'm getting to you is that boosters will soon very likely be available for everyone. And I encourage the tribal nations, particularly those who've done so well, as the secretary mentioned, in getting people vaccinated in their primary vaccination when the boosters become available, get them. And again, these are those available, but stay tuned. We are working very hard to get those boosters available. But certainly right now, the elderly and those who have underlying conditions should essentially get them immediately. I'll close with this last slide, which is really a cartoon telling us where we are. We are in a race with a formidable virus. We have the tools highly effective, safe tools. If we apply them, both with primarily getting vaccinated and with boosters, we unquestionably will win this race against this formidable opponent. I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Next, I'd like to move into the answer and question portion of today's agenda. Thank you to our tribal leaders who were able to be with us and so generously shared their time. This next part is, is going to be the most important part uh, of the day. And we're gonna hear the real issues and questions that our, our tribal citizens have and will be conveyed to you by um, their esteemed representation. Dr. Fauci, I'd like to start with the first question. And one of the things that um, we've learned is that there's lacking research when it comes to American Indian Alaska Natives. And that's especially true, um, unfortunately, when it comes to NIH. And one thing that we share is disparity in funding, Dr. Fauci. And if there was an opportunity to create pathways for some of this research in our tribal communities, through our tribal colleges, through our regional epidemiology centers. And my, my question, Dr. Fauci, is how can Indian country and the up and coming um, researchers benefit from the breaking science that's underway uh, under your leadership, Dr. Fauci? And how can we bring some of those mechanisms to our tribal communities so that we have the data so that we have the relationships and, and the trust of the community to facilitate some of these processes. And um, so the question is, what is NIH doing to ensure Indian country is included in research projects and um, the solution? Uh, Madam Chairperson, that's an extremely important question. And the NIH takes very seriously the importance of getting members, particularly young members of the tribal nations, directly involved in the research effort, as opposed to peripherally having clinical trials, for example, being done when they are not an important part of that. So what have we done? We've conducted three consultations with the tribal nations, and a fourth one is in the works. And the tribal consultation from the National Institute of General Medical Sciences was to help improve what we call the American Research Centers for Health Program, the Native American Research Centers. What that means, that grant funding will now go directly to the tribal nation, point number one. Point number two, we're gonna emphasize on the tribes themselves both conceiving and conducting the research themselves with an increased emphasis on capacity building. And then we're going to do something by working with the communities, which we've done very successfully 
with minority groups outside of the tribal nations, and that's to develop regional training hubs that provide high school students the ability to get a head start on a scientific career. We already have regional training hubs in the state of Washington, Arizona, and Nebraska, and we promise you there'll be more to come. So that's just a bit of what we're doing to answer your important question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. I'm now going to invite Chairman Tilford Denver to ask a question. Thank you, Chairwoman, uh, for allowing me to speak this morning. My question is, a recent study from the CDC showed that one of every 168 American Indian Alaska Native children experience orphanhood or death of caregivers due to COVID-19. This is the highest rate for any population. Native children are already placed at the highest rate of any population in state foster care systems with this crisis further endangering our children's well-being. The CDC recognizes this public health crisis needs and urgent public health response. What are the administration's plans to help tribal nations address this very serious crisis and ensure our children do not experience further trauma and disconnection from our tribal communities? And before I go on, I just need to introduce myself. I'm sorry. Inana Ne Tougher Denver. Hogonovi uh, Way. My name is Tilford Denver. I'm the chairman of the Bishop Paiute Tribe in Eastern California. And I just want to thank again uh, uh, Dr. Fauci and uh, Secretary Basser for all your hard work and working with our tribal communities. Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, give a response on behalf of HHS, what I will tell you is along with Dr. Fauci and all of the uh, professionals at HHS who have a role in trying to make sure that all families are provided with the services they need, especially those who uh, tragically have lost loved ones as a result of COVID-19. What we can tell you is that when we're gonna focus with IHS on trying to serve Indian country, we're gonna to try to make sure that we're providing the direct services uh, immediately where they're needed to our various tribal communities. That means working with you, Mr. Chairman, and other leadership throughout Indian country to make sure that what you need, we will try to provide. And IHS, perhaps the largest agency in the US government that is addressing these needs, and it's addressing it with uh, people of indigenous background, uh, is gonna be there to try to be helpful. Fortunately, under President Biden's leadership, we have more resources than we've ever had to tackle COVID. We know that we have to help so many of those families uh, where children have lost their parent or caregiver. I mentioned that myself earlier and we're ready to, to stand with you. But the, the real work we know gets done in that home, in that neighborhood, in that community. And so uh, please count on us to be there by your side, not just to deliver a particular service, but to be there to work with you in partnership to make sure that we are helping those children, but all the family members who have unfortunately lost loved ones. We're gonna try to do everything we can, as Dr. Fauci said, to prevent people from contracting COVID or certainly dying. But in the cases where they have, we want to be there uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with you as we provide services to care for those individuals who've lost a loved one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Denver and Secretary Becerra. Secretary Becerra, you make an excellent point about the children. And, and Chairman Denver, thank you for bringing that forward. As you know, our children are sacred and it's the, the kinships that exist within our tribes and within our clan systems that tell us where these children belong and they belong with our families. And so thank you for honoring the children, Chairman Denver. At this time, I'd like to invite Vice President Musso. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, good afternoon. Secretary Becerra and Dr. Fauci, thank you for taking the time with us today. I have a question for both uh, Secretary Becerra and Dr. Fauci. 
Uh, my name is Alicia Musso. I'll do my introductions as well. My name is Alicia Musso. I am the vice president for the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Um, and Secretary Becerra, you mentioned a lot of those uh, consultations that we've we've had, and, and a lot of our tribal nations have invited you out to to meet with us um, and do consultation that way, so you can see what healthcare looks like in our communities, and also meet with our people who are living and going through the health disparities and also this global pandemic. And that invite from the Oglala Sioux Tribe still stands. Just wanted to let you know that. Um, we've also been able through those consultations to let you know our needs and and also talk about the nation to nation relationship and uh, treaty and trust responsibilities that um, we always use and talk about. Um, but it hasn't been till recent that I realized we haven't really set a baseline or, or defined treaty and trust responsibilities. So Secretary Becerra, um, I just wanted to know what does the trust responsibility of the US government to provide quality health care to sovereign tribal nations mean to you? And how does that understanding guide policy and decision making in your agency? Uh, Vice President Musso, thank you so much for the question. And, and perhaps given that we have a president and an administration that is truly trying to take us to the next level when it comes to addressing the needs in Indian country, uh, that's a perfect question to ask. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two answers. One, I'm going to give you my personal belief, uh, how I've treated the issue of a trust relationship with Indian country as a member of Congress when I would serve for 24 years in the House, as the Attorney General for the state of California when I championed many causes, including the protection of ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, throughout the country, and now as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, what I will tell you is, personally speaking, to me, it's a relationship, a trust relationship, which has never been fully fulfilled. It's a relationship which, on paper, can be strong, but in practice, has left us wanting. And I do believe that we have an obligation to try to, as a federal government, take this to a higher level so we can prove that our past failures are, are, are in the past. Uh, I will give you a second answer, that is one as a secretary, as, a, as official representative of, of a government, uh, which has to respect the process that we're in. And right now, as you know, we're in litigation on a number of matters that involve the trust relationship with tribes. And what I will tell you there is that the courts will give us a more clear definition of what we mean by that trust relationship. But I will tell you, speaking as secretary, but personally, that I hope that all levels of government, whether it's our courts, whether it's our executive branch or our congressional branch, our legislative branch, recognize that the only way you have a trust relationship is if there is confidence. And we must build that confidence together. And the way I believe our federal government can build, build that confidence is to show that we recognize that moving forward, we have to look at what was done in the past so we can make it good moving forward. And so respecting the legal process, but understanding my own personal uh, beliefs in this particular cause, I hope that we as a nation will fulfill our trust obligation to the very peoples that believed that they could trust our federal government in signing those declarations and those treaties. Thank you, Secretary. We look forward to that. And I know our people understand their treaty rights and they are waiting as well for us to do the work and, and make that happen. So thank you for your time. Uh, Dr. Fauci, thank you for giving that overview of where we're at currently. And thank you, most importantly, for, for your leadership um, from the Oglala Sioux Tribe uh, COVID-19 response team and task force. We look to you for guidance. We've also, like uh, Chairwoman said, we look to other tribal nations. So the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe has been a great ally as well as um, Dr. Jill Jim from the Navajo Nation has taken the time to communicate with us and discuss with us and help us get through this. So thank you to those tribal nations um, for your leadership and for your support during this time. We are still in this global pandemic and um, we, we continue to look to you, Dr. Fauci, for guidance. Um, I know that has not necessarily been the same in, in the rest of the nation, but here at the Oglala Sioux Tribe, we do look for you for that guidance. Um, you did mention we are currently at a high rate and we've plateaued there. Um, so my first question, and I have another follow-up question, uh, is, is given that we're at this high rate, what is fueling that? And also, what does that make for our current fall and our, our upcoming winter? Yeah. Well, 
The high rate is related, to, well, thank you for that question, Madam Vice President. The high rate is multifactorial. First of all, we are dealing with a virus, as I mentioned on one of the slides, that is extraordinarily capable of transmitting from person to person. There's no doubt about that. Number two, even though the tribal nations have done very well in getting a very high percentage of their population, when you look at the slide I showed, there are 60 million Americans who are eligible to be vaccinated who have not yet gotten vaccinated. That is too high a percentage because what that does is that allows the viral dynamic to circulate in the general population of the United States, which means because, and that's the reason why I emphasize with my slide, the waning immunity. The vaccines are really good, but the protection with two doses starts to come down. And when it starts to come down and you have so much virus in the community, what that does is make even vaccinated people vulnerable. They do much better in that they have much less of a likelihood when they get a breakthrough infection of getting seriously ill, but they still can get infected, which is the reason why I emphasize to you, and I hope you translated that to your people, why it's so important when the boosters become available to get available. Third in the multifactorial, when the colder weather comes, people tend to be indoors more. Ventilation inevitably is poorer indoors than it is outdoors. That leads to a respiratory infection more likely spreading from person to person. And for one reason or other, people get fatigued with wearing this. And what they do is when they're indoors, they take it off. So we've got to examine all of those factors and say, how can we diminish the negative impact of each of those? Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Fauci. We've definitely been pushing vaccines and masks in Indian country. We'd have some true leadership um, in Indian country during this pandemic. So I want to thank those other tribal nations for their leadership. Um, my last question is, um, you know, given your experience with infectious disease and, and many pandemics and endemics, if you were a leader of a nation, how do you plan and prepare for individual or, or co-occurring public health emergencies that we are sure to have coming? Well, Madam Vice President, I'm glad you asked that question because what Secretary Becerra and his staff as the HHS approach is spearheading a pandemic preparedness plan that involves the NIH, the CDC, the FDA, ASPR, BARTER, all of us not only are responding now to the real and present danger of what we're going through, but looking ahead of what we can do for the next inevitable. And it may not be when you and I are around or it may be next year, but we're gonna be prepared for that. So that's the reason why if you go back to the first slide, it says lessons learned and remaining challenges. And that's exactly the way we look at the future. Thank you, Dr. Fauci and Secretary Becerra for your time. Chairwoman, thank you. Thank you, Vice President Musso, Dr. Fauci and Secretary Becerra. I'd now like to invite Chairwoman Amber Torres to visit with us and, and share some questions. So good morning, everyone. My name is Amber Torres. I'm the chairman for the Walker River Paiute Tribe here in Shores, Nevada. I want to thank you for allowing me to ask a question of Secretary Becerra. Yeah, my question is, we have had meaningful consultation more now under this new administration than I can ever recall before, which shows me that President, President Biden is committed to honoring his word to Indian country. He has picked you to continue leading these efforts on behalf of DHHS. As a tribal leader, our requests continue to be the same for the past 20 years, such as full funding for IHS, as we know this program is severe, severely underfunded, moving the appropriations from discretionary to mandatory funding as our ancestors paid in full long ago. 
making sure that the special diabetes program for Indians is permanently reauthorized and fully funded so we can continue to plan years ahead for a better way of life that our people deserve. And fully implementing self-governance through HHS in every department because no one knows the needs of our tribal nations better than those that are boots on the ground providing these services day after day. And direct funding, not state to tribe. My last comment would be that we need you to take the initiative to fund and seat a health policy political appointee within your cabinet. Can you commit to these requests and let us know what we can do to continue to help build a true partnership to bring these trust and treaty obligations to fruition once and for all? I truly feel that if these requests had been honored and implemented, Indian country would have been better prepared for COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for the opportunity. Chairwoman uh, Torres, let me begin by saying I uh, thank you for recognizing some of the work that uh, President Biden and his administration have undertaken. I agree with you. Uh, in, in my time serving both in Congress and now here as Secretary, I've never seen a president and an administration more committed to try to work with Indian country and actually to provide resources than what we've seen from President Biden. And that means that the result will be that at HHS, our Indian Health Services uh, agency will be able to do more than it's ever been able to do before. And so I hope you continue to challenge us on the things that you hope to see, because as I've mentioned, as you just uh, portrayed, there is far more that we need to do. We are pushing. By the way, this is the first time I think you've seen a president not only dramatically increase funding for IHS, but at the same time call for Congress to provide direct appropriations, uh, mandatory appropriations. Those are things that could have been done many years ago. They weren't. This president has undertaken that effort. And we're on the verge of successes on some of those things. So we're building. And there's no doubt that we have a ways to go to make up for the lagging uh, efforts that had, we've seen in the past. So what I will tell you is this. Keep testing us. Keep challenging us. Uh, one of the pillars that we hold in, at HHS, I've told my team, is transparency, equity, and accountability. Your question goes to the issue of accountability. Uh, we have to make sure that we are representative of all peoples in this country. And as I mentioned, there is not an agency, a department in the federal government that has a higher representation of people of Indian uh, ancestry that work in their department than the Department of Health and Human Services. And so we're gonna do everything we can to not only show that we're gonna provide the services and the resources, but we're gonna do it with people who represent those communities that we're trying to serve well. And whether it's at the highest level, at the secretary, or some of the uh, people, the, the advisors and executives who work within the administration, we hope that we can prove to you when you challenge us that we're gonna meet that challenge. So thank you for the question. And we look, look forward to continuing to work with you to really overcome what has been a lack of commitment from the federal government from centuries back moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chairwoman Torres, and thank you, Secretary Becerra, for those answers. I'd now like to recognize Nicholas Lewis. So um, back to that infrastructure funding. Uh, we may be having some technical difficulties, but if we're not able to hear from Councilman Lewis, do we have Chairman Tim Davis available? Okay, well, we're really making the case for, for uh, expanded infrastructure and IT capabilities. This time, I'd like to just um, see if we have Chief Bill Smith with us. Okay, well, because I've got the mic, I'm just gonna ask this question, Dr. Fauci. Tribal nations have been approached by NIH to participate in research on COVID-19 therapies, testing, and vaccines. What is NIH doing to ensure that NIH funded researchers respectfully partner with tribal nations on this research? Is NIH following all research 
oversight laws and policies on tribal law? What is NIH doing to ensure that research are not being, are researchers are not being coercive in their recruitment efforts to vulnerable American Indian Alaska Native communities? That is an extremely important question, uh, Madam Chairperson. And that's something that the NIH takes extremely seriously. Um, true, there have been historical uh, precedent in a negative way of advantages that had been taken of people who were the subject of clinical trials in the sense of not making them full partners in the design and in the conduct of the trial. So what we at NIH have extended the opportunity for tribal nations to participate or even to lead the clinical trials through something that we've set up called the NIH Tribal Advisory Committees, where tribal leaders serve on the advisory committee. The Coronavirus Prevention Network and the NIH Community Engagement Alliance, which is referred to as SEAL, C-E-A-L, for Community Engagement Alliance, has now been working in partnership with the tribal community members and their leadership. And we have established, under Dr. Uh, David Wilson, the Tribal Health Research Office, or THRO, T-H-R-O, and my institute, as well as other institutes at NIH, have worked closely with the tribal nations to protect their communities in the right way, to protect them from exploitation, and to guarantee that they reap the rewards of the research of which they will be active participants. And so thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, for that answer. And thank you to all those that participated on our panel today. We really had some engaging dialogue. And I'd like to thank the, the tribal leaders who brought the voice of your people. And recognizing that the pandemic is not over, we'd like to continue this dialogue in a nation-to-nation -nation fashion. And while you're doing that, and in the meantime, I encourage you to deploy the funding, invoke the recommendations of the tribal consultation, and listen to the relatives. We have the teachings of our ancestors, we have the songs, and we have all the things that kept us going. And so please call on Indian country for the solution and call on the wisdom of our elders that brought us to this point. So with that, I hope you have a blessed day and you continue to think of Indian country when you craft solutions at the White House. Thank you, thank you.